Hey, thanks for coming. Um, this is our ninth year holding the uh, Stefan Fiennes Lecture in Diabetes uh, to honor Steve Fiennes. Uh, uh, Steve was chief of the endocrine division for a stretch of years, but is most noted for his work as both the leader of our uh, NIH-funded Diabetes Research and Training Center, which was one of the initial cohort of centers nationally, uh, to be funded by the NIH, subsequently split into its two component parts. The DRTC split into the Diabetes Research Center and the Center for Diabetes Translational Research. Both of those parts live on at, to this day uh, at Michigan. Steve's own work, his individual work, focused significantly around clinical research, specifically around uh, familial diabetes that was inherited in a dominant way. Um, he is the person who named the complex known as MODI, uh, Maturity Onset Diabetes of the Young. Uh, I want to throw a special welcome to Steve's son, John Fiennes, sitting right here. Uh, presumably, uh, you know, John loves Steve as a dad. We love Steve as a colleague in a professional way. But uh, he was really a member of our family who lives on in the division to this day. Um, and it's our honor to carry on that tradition and also to have you here. It's a, it's a big deal for us. Um, I want to acknowledge our Fiennes Lecture Nominating Committee, uh, Chuck Barant, Bill Herman, Martin Myers. Um, at the early going of the Fiennes Lecture, uh, Steve himself participated in a very active way, and he named all the initial sets of Fiennes Lecturers, but he knew he would pass the baton to this group, and they've done a great job. Since the time uh, that they started, our first Fiennes Lecture, Graham Bell, uh, Marcus Stoffel, Susumu Museno, uh, Ron Kahn, uh, Phil Gordon, uh, Steve Kahn, uh, Paul Zimmet uh, and Morris White last year. Uh, this year, and I, I again apologize, we have the bearded version of Bruce Boitler, but you just have to pretend, just try to pretend, just cover like this. But um, uh, I, I'm not going to eat up the time of this grand rounds by giving the typical, this is my second time introducing a Nobel laureate. Uh, the first one, I used the entire hour, so then the person got up and said, well, I don't have any time, and sat back down, so I don't want to do that. Uh, but I will at least say, um, just tell you a little bit about him, his bachelor's training at UCSD and a medical degree at University of Chicago. Uh, he had been on and off at UT Southwestern over the course of his career, uh, doing uh, both medical uh, internship and residency there. Uh, and he then moved to the Rockefeller University where he did fellowship and research in Tony Sarami's lab uh, and this work focusing on TNF-alpha uh, later on uh, advanced into his work to focus on the receptor that recognizes uh, bacterial lipopolysaccharide. Come back to that in a second. Um, Bruce moved to UT Southwestern again uh, as an assistant professor and stayed there until the year 2000 and then moved uh, to Scripps, uh, where he eventually became the chairman of the genetics department there. And he returned to UT Southwestern uh, in 2011 uh, and has been there now continuously for the past seven years, where uh, he holds a number of titles, including the Raymond and Ellen Willey Distinguished Chair in Cancer Research, the Regental Professor and Director of the Center for genetics of host defense. I didn't mention anything about the Nobel Prize. It slipped my mind. Uh, the key thing uh, being that there was a shared Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine in 2011, Jules Hoffman and Bruce and Ralph Steinman, for different elements of the innate immune uh, response, uh, dendritic cells for Ralph and the toll and the Drosophila work from Jules and uh, the TLR4 cloning uh, from Bruce. Uh, what I really wanted to say, uh, since I know that the diabetes community is significantly represented in this audience, and thank you for coming, by the way, since it is, the, after all, the Fiennes Lecture in Diabetes. So we in the diabetes community have been embroiled in some very active discussions, I would say, in the last five years in particular, uh, about the two camps that have split off. Uh, both groups are right, by the way. I just want to and say this to begin with. So there is a group that feels that, uh, you know, the rodent models do not faithfully replicate what's going on in the human disease, and there is a push to uh, 
advance human diabetes disease research to humans. And I'm not against that. Uh, on the other hand, in this talk, I want you to get uh, the feeling for what might be found using the rodent model as a way to explore at a molecular level what might go on uh, in the human. And I'm not against that. <laughs> so with that in mind, please uh, welcome Bruce Boitler. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, really a pleasure to be here. And uh, I... Okay. It's an honor to be here and, and give this lecture in Professor Fine's memory. I'm very sorry I didn't have a chance to meet him. Um, and I want to tell you a story about a kind of diabetes that we might call a Modi today. And uh, I will tell you more generally to begin about our whole approach to the mouse and to the creation of diseases, sometimes the suppression of diseases in the mouse, what forward genetics has become. I got into genetics a little bit late in life. I was about in my early 30s. Uh, I had been very interested in the whole problem of endotoxin sensing for a long time, but really had danced around the issue. I knew that there were mice that were highly resistant to lipopolysaccharide, showed essentially no response to it, and it was widely assumed they had a receptor problem. I used bio biochemical methods and immunological methods to look for the defect in the strain, and those were all very frustrating. And finally. Uh, in 1993, I turned to using genetics to track down the mutation. And I fell in love with the whole process of starting with phenotype and ultimately tracking it down to a, a single nucleotide change in this particular case. Of course, that was difficult at one time. Uh, in our particular case, we had an interval that we felt was 2.6 million base pairs in size. Really, it was about 5.8 million. If you look at the mouse sequence today, we were deceived by the paucity of crossing over in the region, and uh, we never really could believe it was that large. Not only that, but in searching for the mutation, we started in the middle of a huge contig of back clones and sequenced bidirectionally and uh, looked for years to try to find the gene content of this interval. And only after going through about 90% of the DNA did we find the one credible candidate in the region, toll-like receptor 4, which did turn out to be the lipopolysaccharide receptor. Nonetheless, <clears throat> as I said, I was enamored of the whole process of starting with phenotype and tracking down its cause and thereby understanding something new about a biological system. So I moved to Scripps in the year 2000, not long after we finished with the LPS locus, and I began to create new phenotype using ethyl nitrosourea with the intention of understanding toll-like receptor signaling pathways, but other things too, because I was interested in lots of different aspects of biology. This too was a slow and, for the most part, a blind process. We would give ethyl nitrosourea to male black six mice, cross them to females, get G1 males, which we would again cross to black six females to produce daughters that could be heterozygous for mutations that were present in the heterozygous state in the G1 parent. We would then cross back to the G1 father and get a G3 generation where for the first time you could see homozygosity for mutations. And indeed, we began seeing a lot of strange-looking mice, and in every case, ultimately, we tracked down the mutation. Of all of these, this was the most interesting mouse. It was a phenotype we called mask, and these mice have severe iron deficiency, which leads to their alopecia and also to a severe iron deficiency anemia. All of this is corrected if you give the animals large doses of iron. <clears throat> 
Through this process, in my years at Scripps, we tracked down something like a hundred phenotypes that we created. We learned that almost all phenotype results from coding change when you use this mutagen. We didn't know how much coding change we were making, and my guess at the time might have been four or five coding changes per sperm or per G1 mouse. We also made very small pedigrees with one G1, two G2 daughters, about six or so G3 animals produced in order to minimize cost. The reasoning being we don't need to see the phenotype over and over again. As you'll see, that opinion has changed completely and the whole process has changed recently. In those days, also, we had no organized way of keeping track of our mutations. We and others would make Excel spreadsheets and make PowerPoint illustrations. And in general, you have to keep in mind no mutations were found except for the one we were after, the one that we ultimately tracked down. When whole genome sequencing and later whole exome sequencing became possible, we introduced the term uh, incidental mutations to keep track of the non-causative mutations that had been seen in the pedigree. Back in 2007, I found a slide where we had at that point mapped 90 phenotypes to chromosomes. And when we found the causative mutation or believed we had, we would fill it in with green. And uh, we were mainly after immunological phenotypes. To be very honest, we'd only found about 49 of those by that point. And this was over a period, ultimately, of about 11 years that we moved at that sort of rate. We organized all of our work eventually with a website made for the lab called Mutagenetics, and it had processes and cues and ultimately links to powerful software that automated mapping. If you want to visit Mutagenetics, you can do so you'll see something like 544 mutations that we solved now on public display, all fully annotated and described. Along the way, uh, all of us who were doing this kind of work had confidence that things would get better and that positional cloning wouldn't be necessary in the way that it was before. By 2002, the annotated mouse genome sequence was published then no one ever had to go cloning DNA and searching for genes again. You would map to a certain interval and you would know what the candidate genes were, at least in the vast majority of cases. We wrote software that would drive a robot to sequence across a critical region, exon by exon, until finally we would find one and only one coding change in most cases. By 2009, it was practical for the first time to sequence a whole mammalian genome in an ordinary laboratory, and then the new approach began to be that you would uh, find just one mouse that uh, had a homozygous mutation, if you were sure it was recessive, and you would sequence that and you would look for the mutation in your critical region. By 2011, things got even much better because whole exome sequencing was possible. That opened the way to sequencing the G1 mice and knowing up front all of the mutations that they could transmit into the pedigree beneath them. It became clear to us at that point that the number of mutations that we were creating was much larger than we had guessed. But genetic mapping remained unavoidable, and this became the bottleneck in the whole procedure. Uh, the rote procedure was, if you saw a phenotype, you would generate a homozygous stock, you would outcross the mice to another strain, and in time we began using the black 10 strain because we would not lose many things, at least, by modifier effects. Then you'd back cross to your mutant stock, you'd genotype and phenotype the F2 animals, and uh, then uh, you would finally uh, sequence the homozygote uh, to find, as I said, the single mutation within the critical region. But all of this took much too long. Uh, you can imagine that, first of all, postdocs would find a phenotype, and that would be the only time they would ever see it. But that didn't keep them from trying to see it again. And they would uh, look at hundreds, maybe thousands of mice, hoping that it was a very low-penetrant situation, and they would uh, 
be disappointed in the end. Even if they found it, they weren't able to positionally clone as quickly as they could find phenotypes, so the number of unsolved issues in the lab grew, and there were 20, then 100, then several hundred stocks sitting around in the mouse room in various states of mapping or attempts to map. So a new approach was needed to map instantaneously. It occurred to me that we could do this in principle uh, without outcrossing to another strain if we knew all the mutations that we were inducing with ENU. Uh, in that case, they themselves could serve as markers and mapping could be performed automatically by computation by measuring the statistical association between homozygosity for a particular mutation and the presence of phenotype, for example, one could set up computations for dominant additive and recessive models of inheritance. And that led to a new method in the laboratory, which we use today. I can say that now, if we detect a phenotype in the lab today, we know at the same time, with a great measure of confidence, what the causative mutation is. How is that done? As ever, we mutagenize G0 mice and we make G1 animals, but then every G1 is whole exome sequenced to find all the mutations they contain. And uh, we know now, from having done this with thousands of G1 mice, that the mean number of mutations that change coding sense per exome is 60. This was the case in January 2017, and it hasn't really changed since then. If there are less than 30 mutations, or 30, we deem that that's really not worth our time, and we will archive those mutations as frozen sperm, but we don't move on to breed the mice or try to create G2 and G3 offspring. If there are greater than 30 mutations, we order an AmpliSeq panel, a collection of PCR primers targeting every one of the mutation sites that lets us genotype the descendants of these mice and determine their zygosity at every mutation site. Nowadays, we make a large pedigree. Typically, 10 to 14 G2 daughters are produced, and we aim for 50 G3 offspring of both sexes. And all of those mice get genotyped to know what mutations they carry in the case of G2 and the zygosity of the mutations in the case of the G3 animals. This is all done by ion torrent sequencing, which is rather nimble and quick and easy to turn around. One can do about three pedigrees on one chip in this machine, and it takes about eight hours. The mutations can be displayed mouse by mouse going across the top axis, and mutation by mutation, these are gene symbols on the vertical axis. Here I'm displaying homozygous reference allele genotypes, um, heterozygous genotypes in green, and in blue, uh, homozygous variant mutations. If you were to mouse over that page, in the real website, you would see that you have cases of heterozygosity with nearly equivalent numbers of uh, variant and reference calls. This would be a homozygous uh, reference allele, a homozygous variant. But the important thing is that you can separate them and distinguish, and with this method of genotyping, you can. You get a pure reference population, heterozygote population, and variant population of calls. And since it's such good separation, you hardly ever make a wrong call. And all of the data can be uploaded very quickly. And only then, when the mice are all genotyped, are they fed into the phenotyping pipeline. This pipeline takes a few months. And on average, each mouse is subjected to 88 different assays of function or development or whatever. We start by looking at motor performance on a rotor rod to find ataxia or dystonia mutations. We then check the innate immune competence of the mice, looking for their TLR, NLR, and double-stranded DNA responses in isolated macrophages. Then the mice get immunized in two different uh, T-dependent ways with ova alum, 
or with a recumbent some leaky forest virus vector that codes for beta-galactosidase. Along the way, we do flow cytometry on the blood. We also do a T-independent challenge with NP FICOL. We look at NK cell killing potential. Uh, we do a glucose tolerance test on the mice, out of which one mouse came, as you'll see. Uh, we also uh, do a test for allergies, giving a second OVA injection or an injection with papain, which is an allergen, and measuring IgE responses to these proteins. Bone density is measured, blood pressure, heart rate. We give dextran sodium sulfate to the mice. What is that? That's a mild cytotoxin that uh, will injure the epithelium of the GI tract. We give a dose that is harmless to most mice, to normal black six mice, but exceptional animals develop severe diarrhea and weight loss, and that's the assay. We simply weigh the mice at day seven and day 10. And what we are looking for, in effect, is a failure to repair the epithelial damage adequately uh, to invoke homeostatic mechanisms that prevent colitis from occurring. The mice are then given to several other labs uh, where addiction-related behavior is looked at, the ability to resist or reject melanoma cells that are injected IV or sub-Q. Also, the mice are looked at uh, ophthalmologically, circadian rhythms are checked, an innate fear screen is done. A separate pipeline of mice goes to Maria Sharur, who does autism-related screening. As of yesterday, I tabulated our mutations and found we had created 142,500 coding splicing variants uh, that fell into 20,172 genes and subjected them to screening, all of these mutations. The total gene number in the mouse is said by some authorities to be 24,977, and that would mean that we modified 80.8% of all genes at least once. These mutations were parceled out within a total of 80,411 G3 mice from uh, 2,554 pedigrees. In screening the mice, we did a total of nearly 12 million statistical tests of association, testing the null hypothesis that this mutation has nothing to do with this phenotype. Now, of course, we're looking in multiplex, but I can tell you this is still quite a lot of mouse handling that goes into making 12 million tests of anything. Again, an average of 88 assays were performed per G3 mouse, and the question that may be occurring to you is, how much damage did you do to the genome in making all this assessment of phenotype? Uh, what percentage of genes did you damage or destroy? We used to look at that question kind of indirectly in a hand-waving manner, and uh, I'll explain. These plots represent uh, computational simulation of the transmission of the mutations we actually made to um, G3 mice, and we're plotting the percentage of genes that have been modified three times or more in the homozygous state uh, in that population of G3 mice. The red bar indicates where we were on a particular day when this assessment was made, and we could project into the future how much saturation there would be with more and more mutations fed into the G1 pipeline. The green curve represents all mutations. The brown curve, if it is brown here on on the big screen, represented mutations that were either uh, probably null, meaning premature stop codons or critical splice junction errors and the like, or said by polyphen 2 to be probably damaging. The blue curve was just probably nulls alone. And we knew that probably null mutations didn't explain the totality of phenotype because most phenotypes came from missense errors. So this was uh, an underestimate of how much damage we were doing. On the other hand, we knew that polyphen 2 overcalls damage, and we knew that many 
probably damaging mutations don't really affect protein function sufficiently to cause a phenotype. So that was an overestimate of damage. And we took the medium of the two, the average of the two curves, and said, well, that's probably about where we are in saturation. We knew the value was circumscribed by these curves, but to take the average was not really rational. We noticed that if we simulated mutagenesis, we got a different result than if we actually looked at how many mutations had been brought to homozygosity. Specifically, in the real world, there were fewer mutations brought to homozygosity and less saturation. You might imagine why that is. When you work with real mutations, they have real effects. Some of those effects are lethal effects, and the mice just don't show up with mutations in particular genes. The biggest departure was seen with the probably null mutations, as you might also expect. And I've just sketched these in. These aren't the authentic curves. But the method used to understand uh, what fraction of genes are essential for life, in our hands anyway, was to simulate again, but this time introduce uh, a, an essential quality into 10% of genes selected at random, or 15%, or 20%. And gradually the curves were all depressed until they came to overlie the real data exactly. From that exercise, we were able to say, sorry, we were able to say that 34% of genes are essential for survival. Again, using this binary uh, assay. And we then were able to take uh, a curated set of essential genes, several thousand of them, and look at our mutations once again with different polyphen 2 ranges uh, in isolated mutations where that was the only mutation on the chromosome and ask, what's the real likelihood that a polyphen 2 mutation called probably benign will create a lethal effect? The answer was 4.5%. If polyphen 2 said possibly damaging, the likelihood was 9.8%. If it said probably damaging, the likelihood of a lethal effect by that mutation falling in an essential gene was 17%. Interestingly, if we took our set of probably null mutations, uh, they weren't assuredly lethal, even if they fell into uh, a, an essential gene. You may imagine why that's the case. There are actually a few explanations. Maybe the curated set wasn't true, for one thing. But assuming it is true, and we have reason to think it really is true, there are mechanisms of escape. The mutation may fall quite near to the C-terminus of the protein, and the protein has residual function. Or the mutation may reside within a skippable axon that gives an in-frame product. In any case, a point mutation generally isn't as robust as a knockout designed to be a knockout. Overall, 17% of ENU-induced mutations, or about one in six of them, actually do anything. If you look at this uh, lethal model, it is true that some of them might cause a minor decline in the activity of an enzyme, for example. But if you look at the binary question of life or death in genes that are essential, only one out of six ENU-induced uh, mutations will actually cause a severe effect. And we take this rather strict estimate, then, and we're able to sum across the entire genome and ask, overall, what's the likelihood of damage to all proteins from the mutations that fall into any gene or all genes? Putting all that behind us, I can tell you the answer, and it's still dependent on whether you insist on seeing the mutation in homozygous form once, twice, three times, or more times. We generally think, for most of our screens, two observations is sufficient and by that criterion, we've damaged or destroyed 35% of all genes in the genome, this over a period of about four years with ENU. We could have gone faster, 
But I can tell you, first of all, it's rather expensive to do this, and second of all, doing so many phenotypic screens uh, restrains us quite a bit in what else we can do. I mentioned to you that we know right away if we see a phenotype what the probable cause is. The computer announces this to us, and we had to write software to make that a reality. This software is a program by the name of Linkage Explorer, which allows you to survey by screen, by gene, by particular types of mutation, to restrict your search to pedigrees of a certain size, if you wish, to set the p-value for the association you're looking for, and to find all of those mutations that satisfy the criteria you have in mind. Let's take an example here. We might be interested in phenotypes like uh, this fax phenotype, situation in which CD8 cells have a high CD44 mean fluorescence intensity. That's a marker of lymphocyte activation. We can restrict the search only to cases where there are at least 30 G3 mice, where we are seeing at least three homozygous variants, and where the p-value is less than 0.005 with Bonferroni correction. We also demand that these be good or excellent candidates, and I'll return to what that means in a minute. If you click return, you get a set of genes right away, a list of genes that can be sorted by pedigree, and many of these have been named because we believe that they really are causative mutations and have verified it in some cases. The program tells you if you're looking at a phenotype only linked to the putative causative mutation, you see the trivial name we give to the phenotype, the name of the gene, the coordinates of the mutation, what type of mutation it was and its probable effects. The screen is always the same in this case. Here you have the assessment of how good a candidate it is, the number of homozygous reference, heterozygote or homozygous variant mice. And over to the right, you have the linkage between phenotype and genotype as a p-value, either from additive assessment of inheritance, recessive, or dominant. We can click on one of these. If it's in red, it, you know it fulfilled your demand of the p-value and immediately you get a Manhattan plot. The Manhattan plot shows every mutation in your pedigree. It shows strong linkage in this case on chromosome 18, and if you mouse over these mutations, you would see what they are. You notice that two of them co-localized. That's not very common anymore, given the large pedigree size that we make these days. In this case, both of the mutations are in the same gene, and the gene is the DIAP1 gene. You may not know what DIAP1 is, so you click on one of the points, and it tells you already quite a bit about the gene, what uh, is known about it, its structure, its modular architecture, where the mutation is. You can also look at a gene model, and you see in this case that the mutation falls within this particular exon, it's predicted not to affect splicing and so forth, all the things that we used to have to do by hand. But from this sort of result, you could regard this as a good candidate. If you right-click on the Manhattan plot, you see the phenotypic performance of that mutation. Homozygotes have a high CD44 MFI. Heterozygotes have a rather low one. There's a hint of semi-dominant effect and uh, reference allele mice are very similar to the wild type black six. Sometimes, of course, you get more confidence if you hit the same gene over and over again and have an extensive allelic series. The computer recognizes when that happens and automatically incorporates multiple alleles into a super pedigree where all of the mutations are pooled, including all of the mutations in that particular gene. We have both gene-based and position-based superpedigrees. Sometimes you see the very same mutation in different pedigrees. Why is that? Sometimes it can be transmitted from the same G0 mice to multiple G1 mice. Other times it's a background mutation in the Jackson Lab stock, and the computer can recognize the difference between the two. 
it uh, is the case that a couple thousand mutations are from Jackson origin. I'll show you one such example. At present, uh, as I mentioned, we've uh, hit 80.7% uh, <clears throat> of genes once. 75.5% have been touched at least twice by mutation. And in fact, the curve can be plotted. These are genes that were not hit at all so far. These were hit once, twice, three times, four times, and so on. And there are those that have been hit more than 100 times. As saturation is approached, you can imagine that this peak will drop and the peak that follows will roll rightward until when I'm a very old man, uh, even older than I look with the beard, all of the mutations will be pressed against the rightward side of the screen. Here we have the position-specific super pedigree, a JAX mutation that was picked up in multiple flow cytometry screens and for MCMV susceptibility. It was present in 22 different pedigrees that didn't share G0 ancestors. And as a plot, you find that none of the hundreds of other mutations in those pedigrees scored significantly in the screen, but this one mutation did. If you were to right-click on that, you would find a color-coded version of the scatter plot I showed you earlier, pedigree by pedigree. And what I'd like you to observe is that there's a great deal of overlap between the homozygotes and the heterozygotes. And... Uh, this would have been terribly difficult to positionally clone in the old days. Just murder. You would have had to take extreme outliers and hope for the best, and even then it probably wouldn't have worked because there's so much overlap. And yet here it fell into our hands. It was no effort at all to clone this. It was just something that we noticed after a time. The current state of our work, then, is that we've destroyed or severely damaged 35% of all genes and looked at them twice or more in the homozygous state. We've named a total of 1,253 phenotypes that emanate from 886 genes of interest, and many of these are new. I'll tell you how many shortly. Of these, 812 mutations in 594 genes have non-redundant function in immunity or inflammation. We can begin to get an idea of just how many uh, genes you need to make a rather good immune system. Although, I must admit, we're not looking at everything to do with immunity. We're covering quite a bit of it. 94 of those genes have been validated by CRISPR-Cas9 targeting. We typically either knock out the gene if we know the knockout to be viable, or we make a replacement with the exact allele created originally by EMU. There are 900 additional genes in the CRISPR-Q. Now, we don't generally try to validate known genes. In other words, if I were to find a null allele in TLR4 in a mouse that didn't respond to endotoxin, I wouldn't say, well, we better make a CRISPR. I would know that that is the probable cause, and I wouldn't bother with it. Based on that fact, you can guess that uh, by adding 90 and 94 and coming up with 284 out of the 594 genes that were found, something a little bit less than half of all the immune genes that we find are novel enough that we wish to spend the time and effort making CRISPRs. That's how much novelty we're finding in this field. There is a temptation on the part of people to try to find things that are exotic or marginal. And here's where one really has to be careful with this approach. Uh, we're, of course, looking at all these mutations, and it does happen that people really want something to be true, and bias creeps into this fundamentally unbiased method we're using. The example I like to use has to do with olfactory receptors. Early on, before we had much experience with super pedigrees and we hadn't gone to a high saturation, we noticed linkage, rather weak linkage, but it was there nonetheless, between various olfactory receptors and different immune 
phenomena that we were monitoring. And I thought, oh, now that's very interesting. Here it is that uh, we've discovered a whole new class of chemisensory molecules. And it is true, after all, that olfactory receptors are not only in the nasal epithelium, but some of them really are expressed in lymphoid cells. And uh, wouldn't this be marvelous if it is the case that they use the same chemical sensing system to find their microbial quarry, and we found a whole new aspect of innate immunity. And of course, I wasted a lot of money and made a dozen attempts at recreating the phenotypes by CRISPRing all of these sites in olfactory uh, receptors, and none of them verified. In fact, the human is much worse than just letting the machine go by itself and tell you what the answer is. Uh, and that's the danger of hypotheses, and it's why I like the hypothesis-free approach so much. But I decided that we needed something to keep a check on our abilities here and uh, our activities, and we developed a machine learning program that looks coldly and dispassionately at candidates and says whether they're good or bad and worthy of CRISPR targeting or not. By this time, we've done 324 CRISPR jobs to completion for 260 genes. And that means we made the CRISPRs, we expanded the mice into homozygote, heterozygote, and reference allele mice, and we put them through the pipeline again. And on this basis, we're able to teach the program what is a good candidate and what's a bad candidate. There is one embodiment of the program that also uses literature verification so that it's taught that things like a TLR4 mutation uh, really are true if they abolish endotoxin signaling. And that makes the program even more robust. You can again segregate into certain p-values and sizes of pedigrees, but if you click uh, before you get the list, you are taught about how good the program is. We divide declarations of goodness into excellent, or good or better, or potential or better, or not good or better. And I'll blow up the uh, report for you, and you can see that if you have something that is called good or better, then the likelihood that it will validate is 94%. That's extremely good, in my opinion. If it's called excellent, the likelihood it will validate is nearly 96%. In fact, I wonder if with continued training we need to do CRISPR uh, targeting at all at some point. <clears throat> In fact, we always will have to, but that's uh, something I won't go into. The uh, recall, in other words, the sensitivity with which we detect things, is 68% if you take only excellent things, and it's 91% if you take good or better Good or better is the sweet spot. We only try to validate things that are good or better, and they almost always validate. Now notice that even if you don't use this program, with the default settings, 73% of things will validate. It's only when you have a PI who's really kind of an idiot like me, who goes and tries to validate things like olfactory receptors, that you run into trouble. But that is the human tendency, and that's why we use this program. How have we done with our original goal? Over the years, we found 85 mutations in 39 genes that affect TLR signaling. Not all of them were new, but 16 of them were. Those shown in blue here, they affect things that escort TLRs to where they need to be. They affect adapter proteins, the receptors themselves, all of the signaling apparatus down to the level of TNF and TNF processing enzymes. That's not bad, uh, but this is a very well-studied field. We do even better if we look in the area of adaptive immunity. Here we found more than a score now of uh, severe combined immune deficiency locus uh, mutations that are not known generally, only known to us. And they affect uh, many different things. For example, here we have a new regulator of the Wnt system that is a multi-spanning membrane protein. We have a couple of uh, mutations that affect the spliceosome, and in one case also uh, the nonsense-mediated decay apparatus. 
and they're viable, although the knockouts are certainly homozygous lethal. Uh, but these are viable hypomorphs that create severe immune deficiency phenotypes. We hit also a small G protein that nobody has ever bothered to write about or target that creates a severe immune deficiency phenotype, and the knockout is lethal. We have mutations in uh, an RGAP protein that cause a problem with the T-independent B cell response. We have another mutation that makes for an excess of CD8 T cells and more active CD8 T cells as well. Some mutations, in fact, in two broad classes from our allergy screens make a hyper-IgE phenotype. And I believe that these truly are the equivalent of a form of allergy in mice, which also would exist in humans. And this is simply one example of that. The DSS screen has been very productive, and now we have about 100 mutations with 20% saturation of the genome, where uh, we have a failure to invoke the normal homeostatic repair mechanisms. At this point, we've begun surveying humans with monogenic forms of IBD to see if we can identify likely causes. Now, I had in mind to tell you a brief diabetes story here, and I will do so. I point out that we've found a lot of mutations that one might call metabolic, and I certainly couldn't cover them all. But I want to tell you about a small mouse that was seen by Zhao Zhang, a postdoc in the laboratory. He found that it was diabetic as well in that part of our pipeline, but uh, that's... Uh, not the primary observation, it was just that he found these animals that even in maturity were only about half normal size. Here is a plot of their weight, and you can see that they're always small and they stay small. We thought that maybe this was a problem with growth factor and a surrogate for measuring growth is not to look at growth factor itself, which is episodically released in the mouse, but to look at insulin-like growth factor 1 levels. We found that in this strain, which we named teeny, body weight was small, and maybe paradoxically, uh, IGF-1 was very high, and you'll understand why by the end of this talk. It was found that the mice were diabetic, and <clears throat> they were severely diabetic, in fact, with an average uh, level of glucose, fasting glucose of about 650, and also a high hemoglobin A1c. Furthermore, they were insulin resistant. If you give a wild type mouse insulin, its glucose will drop as you'd expect, and in the teeny mouse, insulin would barely budge. We looked over age at changes in both blood glucose and insulin, glucose on the left, insulin on the right. And for glucose, we found that by four weeks of age, the mice were already hyperglycemic, and by eight weeks of age, maximally so, and that would persist for many weeks. Uh, on the other hand, if we looked at insulin levels, we found that they would go up and peak and then gradually decline, suggesting that Ultimately, there was failure of beta cells or of insulin production for one reason or another. We noticed when we measured directly uh, using NMR that the teeny mice were very lean. And uh, we then dissected them and found that the inguinal fat pad was very small in size, epididymal fat even much more so, Brown adipose tissue, also a bit depressed in teeny mice. They had a lipodystrophy. Fortunately, it was a moderate lipodystrophy, not one in which there was no fat left to work with, because having at least some fat was the key to understanding how this mutation works. Like most lipodystrophic animals, the teeny mice get a fatty liver. They have nowhere to deposit any fat that they uh, synthesize, let's say, uh, from the glucose that is taken up by cells, and it tends to accumulate in liver. The liver weight as a percentage of body weight was about twice normal in these mice. 
This phenotype was mapped automatically. It was one of the first to be mapped by our new system, and it was mapped on the basis of body weight. It co-localized with a chloride channel, and in those days we would target both of these, having no super pedigrees to give us the edge toward one or the other. And uh, it turned out, in fact, that the mutation was in a new gene that didn't have a single publication about it, which is what we like best. It was in KBTBD2. Nothing known about this protein at all, except its domain structure. It had a BTB domain, which in Drosophila world stands for bric-a-brac, tram-track, broad complex, a back domain, and several Kelch domains. And it was uh, with this sort of arrangement of domains that people often think that E3 ubiquitin ligase activity is likely. The CRISPR-targeted mice completely reproduced the teeny phenotype. They had uh, insulin resistance, they had high glucose, high insulin, small body size. So we were absolutely confident that this was the causative mutation. Of course, we didn't know what tissue was really affected here. And an interesting experiment done by Zhao was to take wild-type fat, mince it up, and transplant it by injecting it at several sites subcutaneously into the teeny recipients. When he did that, in the glucose-rich environment in which these cells found themselves, they would differentiate quickly into fat. Really, it was... Uh, mesenchymal stem cells that he was transplanting here, and you'd get large vascularized fat pads that look like perfectly normal fat. Remarkably, when you do that and then look at weeks post-transplantation in reciprocal transplants, the teeny mice given wild-type fat uh, would normalize their glucose, and they would also normalize their insulin looking at the red curve, they would normalize to a large extent their hemoglobin A1c and uh, also the ratio of liver weight to body weight would decline and you would see that the liver was pretty much cleared up. No more fatty droplets like usual. Even more remarkably, they would resume growth if this was done at an early age and they wouldn't quite catch up with the wild type controls but they do pretty well, all as a result of uh, the transplant of fat. Zhao looked at the protein, and it was of a class that should interact with Cullen-3, and he broke up both the KBTBD2 and the Cullen-3, and he found that there was interaction with Cullen-3 uh, based on the amino terminus, the BTB domain containing part of the protein. He also looked to see whether he could find anything abnormal about teeny fat. And here he simply did mass spectrometry and found that there were a number of genes that were, uh, proteins that were seemingly overexpressed, but none more so than P85 alpha, which was about 45 40-fold overexpressed in uh, the epididymal white adipose tissue of knockout compared to wild-type animals. Uh, P85-alpha attracted his attention, of course, because this is a key regulatory protein in insulin signaling, and he confirmed that, in fact, it was very much overexpressed in all forms of adipose tissue, but particularly in the epididymal fat. The loss of KBTBD2, therefore, seemed to stabilize P85-alpha, and he could show this in MEF-derived adipocytes as well. P85-alpha wasn't only identified by mass spec, but also in a protein microarray with KBTBD2 used as bait, and he demonstrated that not only could he co-precipitate the proteins, but if he made um, a GST tag and expressed them separately and mixed them 
in vitro, he could do a pull-down in that way as well. He then wondered what part of the protein interacted with KBTBD2, and in this case, it turned out to be the Kelch domains, the C-terminal domains, that would interact if he did pull-downs with fragments of the protein. He did more fancy types of pull-down experiments involving multiple tags, but suffice it to say that the model he came up with, which we believe to be correct, is that P85-alpha interacts with the Kelch domains. The Cullen-3 ligase uh, interacts with BTB, and you have probably uh, the activation of an E2 ligase that transfers a ubiquitin chain to P85-alpha. In vitro, he could also demonstrate that P85-alpha was ubiquitinated by a mixture of ubiquitin, uh, the P85-alpha substrate, KBTBD2 and Cullen-3, and this could be shown to be uh, specifically K48 ubiquitination rather than K63. I want you to notice that if pull-downs were done with IRS1, which interacts with the insulin receptor, and with uh, P85 and with P110, under normal circumstances, in a wild-type mouse, uh, insulin will bring P110 into contact with IRS1. That doesn't happen in the case of uh, teeny cells. With insulin, you don't have binding of uh, P110 to IRS1. And that's the level at which the insulin receptor uh, interaction seems to be interrupted. It's as though P85-alpha, by virtue of its excess, somehow competes with P110 and won't allow the signal to go forward. The next hypothesis would be that you could rescue the teeny phenotype if you knocked out P85-alpha. And so double knockouts were made by targeting the original CRISPR knockout of KBTBD2. And in this case, we found an increase in body weight, a decline in glucose, an increase in fat as a percentage of body weight, decrease in insulin, and restoration of insulin signaling. Overall, the situation seems to be as follows. In the wild-type situation, the insulin receptor will phosphorylate IRS1, IRS1 will recruit the P85-110 complex, and the levels of P85 are maintained at a low level in the cell by the action of KBTBD2, which degrades most of the P85-alpha. On the other hand, in a situation where KBTBD2 is knocked out or missing, as in the case of the teeny mouse, there is an abundant quantity of P85-alpha it occupies sites on IRS1, and probably, as Luke Cantley has shown in overexpression studies with P85-alpha, it winds up in what he calls a sequestration complex with IRS1, and you have no longer any insulin signaling, no AKT activation, no upregulation of the glucose transporters and the like. So here we found a uh, previously unknown protein, KBTBD2, is essential to maintain insulin sensitivity in adipocytes by degrading P85-alpha. Without KBTBD2, you get too much P85-alpha accumulating in fat. That interrupts the insulin signal. That's enough to cause insulin resistance and diabetes. I showed you the transplantation experiment that we did, which suggests that fat is at least a very big part of the whole picture here. And if you put in wild-type fat, that clears up the liver, it ends the diabetes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You get fairly good restoration of a normal uh, physiology. We've, since this time, done transgenic experiments that I really don't have time to talk about, that suggests that KBTBD2 is only important in adipocytes where the overt lipodystrophy diabetes phenotype is concerned. 
Now we wonder, of course, is KBTBD2 regulated in some way? We know that it can be phosphorylated, and that begs the question of just what does phosphorylate it. Zhao, at this point, tentatively thinks that the phosphorylated form is active and the unphosphorylated form not, and one wonders if this has anything to do with diabetes as it's commonly seen. It's not that most diabetes is caused by KBTBD2 deficiency, but definitely it's a major part of the whole machine for glucose homeostasis. With that, I want to conclude. I've shown you this method that we use in the lab to analyze every day about 900 ENU-induced mutations in the homozygous state. Every week we, we go through that many. Of course, only one-sixth of them really do anything, but that's still a lot if you are thinking in terms of examining knockouts. There are people in our group who make the mice and breed them. There are those who sequence and genotype the mice, others who do the screening, a strong informatic group, and finally a CRISPR-Cas9 targeting group, and that all is required to keep this running. This is quite a lot of people who do this work, and I'm very proud of them, and I think they find it quite exciting uh, every day they may walk in and find a new phenotype that's arisen in their screen, and it may be something upon which a career can be based. This, by the way, is Xiao Zhang, who did the work with the KBTBD2, but I must say that not only he is happy with this system, but uh, everyone is, because it really produces. And we are looking for more people who want to join us. So if you find what I've told you cool and interesting and like the idea of letting uh, the mouse tell you what's wrong rather than guessing about it, then uh, write me an email. So thanks very much. <laughs>